Hey guys, welcome to another video. It has been four to six weeks since I last did a calisthenic movement level five mastery update, which means today we're gonna to take a look at phase three, all the pros, all the cons, the ins, the outs, the details. Strap yourself in, get yourself ready, and let's take a look at what's inside. <laughs> We stuck with the same theme that it was four separate training days per week in this phase, just like it has been in the last two phases. Only in this phase, two of the days were higher volume days and two of the days are more classical strength days. And out of those two high volume days, one was a straight arm static hold day and the other one was a dynamic mix of bent arm and straight arm training. So the interesting thing there was it really gave me a chance to see if my theory on dynamic movements only being good to build static movements and i.e. static movements not having great a great place in the training plan for someone looking to get planche and front lever would still be correct or would I be eating my hat and having to confess that I was wrong? More on that later. In terms of what movements were in the program, it was actually quite minimal in this phase. And what I mean by that in terms of overall and total number of exercises, there really wasn't that many. And a lot of the old staples still stayed put. So for example, we still had one arm chin up work, we still had handstand push up work and the dragon flag came back in in this phase. And what I did with those three exercises in particular is I kind of put my own spin on them. So for the one arm chin up, I did one arm chin up eccentrics, where you take a hand off at the top and you lower down as slow as possible, along with pulley assisted concentric work. So lots of singles with plus five kilo. So as you can see, even though I weigh 87 kilo, I'm actually getting quite close to the full thing again. And as a disclaimer, I have done the one arm pull up once in the past out on the beaches of LA when I was probably about five or six kilo lighter. So I'm on a a mission here to get that back. As for the handstand push-up, to supplement the wall work, because I've been putting the balance work into practice in the form of 90 degree handstand push-up eccentrics, just to try and work that pattern alongside the strength gains in the basic pattern against the wall, that was a nice spin. So this was on top of the program that I was already doing. And where Dragon Flags came back in on the scene also, I figured I'd put my own spin on that. So I wanted to try one arm dragon flags, which I had a little play around with during this phase as well, along with some ankle weighted dragon flags and even some straight arm dragon flags where you're just holding on with the fingertips. All three movements were a nice way of spicing it up. And this leads me nicely into a very quick disclaimer. So going back to what I said about the workouts being quite minimal and quite simplistic, this allowed me to work on things outside of this. So I was doing training outside of this program, but I still followed the program in its entirety. I just knew that I could recover from the extra volume. So I did a muscle up day that involved weighted muscle ups. There was also a separate handstand day, which answers the question of the structure of the handstand training. In this phase, it was only two days out of four. So what I did is I took the two sessions, threw them into one day where I worked purely on my personal handstand goals, along with some rotator cuff work, mobility work, and a lot of prehab and rehab exercises. You could almost think of that as a, like an active recovery day or an active rest day, even if you will. Another thing that happened during the phase three run was the infamous 800 pull up challenge, which some of you may have seen in my videos before, where I was having to do 800 pull ups for charity. So this kind of set me back a little bit, which is why this video is a little bit later than you may have liked, because that really, well, that cost me a week of recovery really to get over that 800 pull up challenge. Even my skin alone was just completely annihilated. But it's all good. It only makes you stronger, these challenges, and they are like a once in a lifetime thing. That leads us to what about down below? What about those uh, little twig legs, the anti-flamingo campaign? What was the legs like in this phase? So once again, I think this is a common theme throughout the program. The leg exercises were just two different leg exercises. One was knee dominant, which was a recommended sissy lunge. And the other one was hip dominant, which was a single leg glute bridge, or you could do a single leg hip thrust. So again, as a disclaimer, like the last video, you guys probably know by now, I do my own leg days, but I do try to incorporate a variation of the two movements that Cali Move put in their program, and I program it into the other stuff that I do. So what I did in this phase, because the single leg glute bridge or hip thrust was quite easy for me, I went for a shrimp squat. So I'm trying to work on the deficit shrimp squats, as you see. And 
I continued working on the sissy squat variations as well. Yes, they're both quite quad and knee dominant, but as I've covered in the last episode, I am quite hamstring dominant by nature. That doesn't mean I'm not training hamstrings at all. My hamstring exercise of choice this phase, outside of the program, may I add, was the single leg ring curl, which interestingly enough, if you're looking for a minimalist hamstring leg exercise, give this a go, I dare you. These are a nice, tricky challenge for anyone that fancies themselves as having decently strong hamstrings and glutes. Let me know how that goes. And I know what you're thinking, you're thinking it all sounds quite cluttered, how did I do all that and still call it the same program? Well, I ran the template in its entirety, just around the outsides of those other bigger goals and skills that I had. And in all honesty, I think that they worked well as conditioners and even finishers to some of the, the, the skill training. The two kind of meshed together really nicely. Let's go over the likes versus the dislikes, and let's be unconventional again. Let's do the dislikes first. So what I didn't like about this phase, and here we go, so the suspense is over, the high volume static holds. I was not a fan of this, simply because, as anyone who's done isometric training will tell you, isometrics suck for long duration. You either have that mindset or you don't. I've never naturally been a particularly isometric friendly guy. I find my brain wanders, I find it hard to focus, and it is just, it is just torture as anyone will tell you that's tried to do like a five minute or 10 minute or 20, 30 minute plank. Why the hell you do that, I don't know. But if you have tried that, you'll know exactly what I mean. And I did find that the volume was kind of too high here to maintain it. Now, admittedly, I was doing other stuff outside of this program a little bit, which may have competed with this, but to do high volume, low level static holds, as much as being mentally draining was physically very, very hard. And I find I had to, to regress pretty much all the way back to, to a tuck and maybe even an active hang sometimes and, and, and a basic planche lean for this. So the conclusive verdict on that, guys, is that once again, I still believe that dynamics done through full range with diligence are much better than long duration static holds. Once again, a similar criticism, minimal leg exercises. If this was the only leg training you were doing, I think you would probably be wanting a little bit more for optimal leg development. Now, as a side note, as I've said before, the program doesn't promise leg gains. It's not a leg program. Cali Move are doing what they can to give you minimal equipment, slightly innovative leg exercises that are suitable for people who don't really want to specialize. So I can see why they chose the movements that they did. And one last thing while we've still got the uh, hypercritical eyes out, the higher volume on the certain few exercises, because it was very high volume, made me sore as a motherfucker. Particularly in my pecs when I was doing ring flies, I literally felt like I'd been beaten up in those pecs for days after. Yeah, it subsided as the program went on, but it was a little bit off-putting having to train other movements when you're still carrying that DOMS into the session before. It just makes you feel like you're moving awkwardly and you're just constantly reminded how tender you are. This got a little bit annoying, but I guess this is just a product of high volume training. And that's a great segue into what I liked about the training. So again, I know it sounds like I've just complained about higher volume, but the fact that there was more volume in this program meant that, of course, if you're looking for hypertrophy, aka muscle growth, or even muscle conditioning and a pump and to feel a little bit bigger, that's just what you need, right? High volume training does equal cell swelling and gives you that fuller look in your training. If you do too much strength training in low rep ranges, yes, you can build muscle off that, but you're never gonna look or be as muscular as you would if you do some hypertrophy work. So it was nice to see some hypertrophy work thrown in, even if it did make you sore, or at least it made me sore. One nice move I liked in this phase was the wall walking planche press to handstand. It's like an assisted press to handstand. This was a variation that I had never seen before that I think is really, really great for conditioning the press. And it's one of those movements where some of you guys that are gonna watch this are gonna see this and think that is easy. Why are they only doing that in a tuck? But then for someone like me, who's a very pull dominant shoulder structure, who's always been poor, straight arms overhead, quite tight, not a natural presser overhead, these were really difficult. I even had to resort these to, to tuck slides, which sounds like a complaint, but I like this because that's exactly what you're doing these programs for, is to be challenged whilst learning new drills to help get you more skills down the line. And it was another one of those ones where you could see where it was leading without even being told. You're like, ah, oh, this is gonna have good carryover to other things. Another benefit that occurred to me only when I was looking over the program structure and kind of going over my training journals was just how nice a mix they actually got in this phase of 
all of the different movements that would go together to form good static hold training, so the planche and front lever, and in particular the front lever. Okay, I've criticized the high volume static holds, but if you actually look inside the program, they had bent arm dynamic exercises in the form of front lever rows, and they also had straight arm front lever raises. So really you could argue that you've got static holds to feel out the position, you've got bent arm training to condition the muscles, and then you've got straight arm training to condition the tendons, the ligaments, and of course the muscles, but in a different joint angle. Really, that sounds like a win-win-win to me. And with all of this said, I can't believe this, there is only one more phase to come. So phase four, four phase program, four weeks long each phase, 16 week program, we're almost there. So in the next video, I will be going through the ins and outs of phase four and giving you my take on it. But before we get there, let's do what we always do here and drop a little carrot, dangle a carrot for you guys and tease you slightly and have a little look at the preview that I've got for you. So what we're gonna see in phase four as opposed to phase three, the training frequency actually goes up to five days a week so they are very short sessions done very very frequently so you're training a lot the one-arm push-up comes back in whoop, whoop. love it i missed the one-arm push-up in phase three you saw how devastated i was at the end of phase two so to see that back has made my day. There are also Bulgarian ring dips that arrive on the scene and they are in place of the handstand push-up. So the old boobies are gonna get a bit of love, especially with the one-arm push-up as well as the Bulgarian ring dip. And we see the planche push-up arriving. So the planche push-up progressions and all the stuff that goes along with it are in the next phase too. The handstand push-up phase is out just momentarily, although as a quick disclaimer, I may keep that in because it's a personal weakness of mine. So I'm gonna probably train that slightly outside of the program. And the handstand practice is done on three of the five days. So you're still doing 15 minutes times three. As and when I drop the phase four video, I'll let you know what kind of template I actually went for. I'm sure I will tweak things slightly, but rest assured, the program will be done in its entirety. And what I'll do guys in the next video is do a really, really thorough, almost a kind of four phase look back. So like a really detailed view on everything I found, what I would change, what I would recommend or advise to someone who was doing this program in the future, and all the good stuff. So a really kind of comprehensive review. I hope this phase three video was a nice teaser for you and I hope that's got you stoked for phase four. I know I am. I can't wait to share it with you guys in about four to six weeks time. Stay tuned because I will drop the video there for you. In the meantime though, if you liked this video, please do me a favor and just give me a thumbs up to support the channel. If you like the content and the theme of this channel so far, go ahead and hit the subscribe button, turn on the bell notification so that anytime I publish a video, you'll know or be the first to know. Thanks for watching guys. Have a great week ahead and I'll see you all in the next video. Peace out.